So good evening, um, everybody, uh, or maybe good morning or good afternoon for those uh, further uh, away. My name is uh, Ilke Alam. I'm an associate professor um, in political science at the Brussels uh, School of Governance at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, and also a co-editor of, uh, co-director, sorry, of uh, BERM. And BERM is the interdisciplinary research center of the VUB, the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, which joins over 100 migration and minority researchers from 12 um, different um, disciplines. Together with my uh, colleague Omar uh, Cham, who you see here, is um, and who is a PhD researcher and a teaching assistant at the same um, institution, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to this online webinar on the decolonization of EU or European uh, migration uh, studies. I'm very happy to see that you are so numerously um, attending and from all over um, the world. The webinar um, of today is um, organized by several uh, research groups by um, BERM and the Brussels School of Governance of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, to which Omar and I are affiliated. Um, the webinar takes place within the framework of the course on EU migration policies uh, in the advanced master in European uh, studies. And it's with this webinar and also related, uh, the related readings uh, that we'll, we'll also share with you, uh, we want to offer the students in European studies um, the critical tools needed to understand the current realities of EU migration policies and uh, the moral crisis of Europe, as Germinder uh, Bambra calls it, regarding uh, Europe's failure to act in a manner that is consistent with what are claimed as European values, like human rights and the rule of law. So the webinar is co-organized uh, with IMES, the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies from the University of Amsterdam, to which our first speaker, um, Darshan Vignes Varan, is associated, affiliated, and the research group INEX, um, that researches the politics of exclusion and inclusion at the University of uh, Vienna. And this with the support of the Anti-Racism Working Group of INISCO, the largest um, European network of migration uh, studies. So the topic of today um, calls uh, for decolonizing the university um, and uh, the social sciences have increased in the past years in Europe. And depending on the country, um, especially during the last five years, sometimes last decade, but even more after um, the 2020 transnational Black Lives Matter movement, which intensified um, these calls in the field also of European migration studies. Of course, outside Europe and in minority intellectual circles within Europe, the debates on the decolonization of knowledge production have been ongoing for decades. The definition of, of what decolonization is about will, of course, be uh, the topic of this seminar, but to already briefly uh, go on that road, uh, decolonization um, can be defined as an intellectual endeavor that questions a Western knowledge production that considers itself superior and neutral and that obscures non-Western forms of knowledge. It's an intellectual endeavor that questions the European amnesia or uh, white innocence, as Gloria Wecker would call it, uh, the negligence, negligence and even the deliberate exclusion of the role of colonialism, race, racism in um, understanding current social realities. So it might seem strange at first sight that in migration studies, uh, the role of race, racism and colonial histories have been excluded for so long as explanations of how and why the EU and European nation states reproduce hierarchized, um, hierarchized, wow, so difficult word, <laughs> patterns of exclusion in migration and citizenship policies, especially migration studies, because how can we understand this hierarchy um, in the patterns of our visa policies? How can we understand the far closer scrutiny of racialized citizens ap applying for visa family reunification? How can we explain the longer detention periods for people of color? Um, how can we explain the, the fierce politicization of non-Western migration 
um, in, in comparison to Western migration. And I mean, there's far more examples, but the use of, for example, the terms of mobility um, for the non-racialized and um, migration for the racialized um, individuals. But a closer scrutiny, of course, teaches us, and especially also the work of, amongst others, Philomena Esset, Alana Lentin, Ramon Grossvogel, um, that it's not that astonishing as all. As migration uh, researchers, uh, most often white, have reproduced a hegemonic thinking of Western science that is considered superior and neutral. They, or I should say we, um, have reproduced the hegemonic silence on race and racism in Europe that is dominant in policy circles, in public discourse, in school teachings, in everyday conversations. Um, they or we reproduce the dominant knowledge that racism is supposed to have disappeared after the Holocaust and a dominant thinking on racism that is supposed to be deviant, a deviant act by deviant individuals with little ties to histories of slavery and colonialism. So in this seminar, our distinguished speakers will present their insights into um, what the decolonization of um, European migration, uh, poly uh, European migration uh, studies uh, might uh, mean. Why also it is necessary and how researchers can contribute to um, this endeavor. So let me first um, introduce um, our distinguished speakers um, to you. So first we have in Belgium, that would be Professor uh, Dasha Vignes Baden, uh, the co-director of um, the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies. And he's an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at the University um, of Amsterdam. Um, the um, Dachan uh, edits the Journal of European, the European Journal of International Relations, and is also the editor of the New Migration uh, Politics um, Journal. Um, he is also a senior researcher at the African Center uh, for Migration and Society at Wits University in South Africa. His research lies at the intersection of international relations and political geography, and he aims to understand and explain deep changes in the structure of international politics. And his work is primarily interested in how territory has been reconfigured in response to changing patterns of human mobility and uh, settlement. He has authored several books on migration, two of these on migration in Africa, and published many peer-reviewed articles, amongst which two recent ones, um, um, and that will probably, um, I mean, he will talk about these in his talk, and they very much speak to the uh, topic of today. And uh, in his talk, he will also insist on the need to consider the decolonial project as an epistemological uh, instead of a political uh, project as how it is often uh, portrayed. Our second speaker is uh, Leila Hatch Abdu, a research fellow at the uh, Migration uh, Policy Research Center at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy, but also affiliated to the Department of Political Science at the uh, University of um, Vienna, where she is an assistant professor. Before that, she was also affiliated to the University of Sheffield, John Hopkins University, uh, the University College of Dublin, and the CNRS in, um, in Paris, um, so a bit all over, um, many places. And Leila has published uh, very widely uh, on migration governance, migration protests, uh, immigration, immigrant integration policies, the populist radical right, and far uh, more. And in this webinar, uh, Leila uh, will particularly focus on the practical challenges pitfalls and opportunity of a decolonial approach in uh, migration studies. So Darshan and Leila, we're very happy to have you here and we look forward to your reflections on uh, the path towards the decolonization of European uh, migration uh, studies. Before giving you the floor, let me briefly explain the rules of the game for tonight. So as the participants to this webinar will have seen, you are uh, not visible. Only the member, uh, panel uh, members are, as we are far too many. Um, it's, the chat is not open, but the Q&A box is open for all your questions. So post them 
please in there um, from the moment they come up to you. And uh, you can also upvote the questions by liking them so they move up in the list. Uh, as we are many, um, it might not be possible uh, to answer um, all questions. Um, Darshan and Leila will each present around 20 minutes and also have the opportunity to react to each other. And after that, around 10 past seven at the latest, we open the Q&A, uh, which will be uh, moderated by Omar. So without further ado, um, Darshan, please, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Ilka, thank you very much for that. Um, introduction and also for having me on this panel. Um, and, and thank you for really giving a comprehensive um, overview of what um, we're talking about in terms of the decolonization of migration studies. It's, it's very helpful to have that as a backdrop because what I'm gonna do today is try to provide something far more specific, which is a particular take on what I think the relationship is between decoloniality or decolonial thought and the field that we've come to know as migration studies. Um, and what I'm gonna to do um, to start off with is to start out with an image that I think many of you, and if I can find the screen share function, um, that many of you will have seen and a version of that image on your Twitter feeds um, in probably the last few weeks. Um, now this is an edited version of that, right? So you would have seen a version of this um, image which depicts two people. It's kind of a transphobic image, but what it's trying to capture and it's often used on the left hand side is quantitative studies and on the right hand side is qualitative studies is this image of, of, uh, of academic conversation. Sometimes it's sociology versus anthropology. Sometimes it's, you know, mainstream political science versus critical politics. It's trying to capture um, the sort of uh, strong reaction to the forms of difference produced by new forms of academic knowledge. And I would say that decoloniality has often been framed in this light as um, trying to bring in a whole range of confusing ideas to the more conventional study of migration studies, um, to bring in uh, ideas of normativity, um, of critical theory, of justice, of, um, into a realm that we've commonly thought of as being more theoretically and empirically focused, right? Um, and in the course of today's talk, what I want to suggest is that perhaps we might start to think about this relationship in somewhat different terms, right? Of decoloniality, not necessarily as um, this new and radical form of theory, but as a move in migration studies to, to move this, this field back to some of its more conventional, even positivist mainstream concerns. Um, and I wanna suggest that there's a version of de decolonial theory. And, and I don't wanna say that the political project, right? Which Ilka has really well defined in her opening um, remarks needs to be jettisoned in any way, right? Um, but I wanna say that there's a version of decolonial theory that can be built out of the application of some really very mainstream positivist social science principles to the structure of contemporary migration studies, right? And that what, what decoloniality does in many respects is to just act as a reminder for the need for um, more attention to what I will argue are basic principles surrounding the accumulation of knowledge um, the use of principles of representativity um, and also um, a, a greater understanding of what it means to be objective in the study of migration. And I'm going to do that in three steps and try to use some examples from my own work um, to, to explain what I think the decolonial move does in this more conventional um, framing. And I want to end each of those discussions with an attempt to um, to think through some more hopeful examples of change in the field of migration studies and where we're headed. Um, so let's start off with, um, with a very conventional uh, concept, which is that of the accumulation of knowledge. Um, this is the idea that progress in knowledge can be defined in terms of the 
the acquisition of, of increasing forms of truth claims and their, um, their, their cumulative value, right? That, that knowledge is not simply, um, as, as Kuhn would, would say, a series of paradigms that are historically produced one after the other that have their own internal validity, but that um, knowledge accumulates over time. We, we, we develop assumptions, we test them, and then they become the basis for which we begin to develop other projects, uh, other, other forms of understanding. And this is a very you know, conventional understanding that has particularly informed a lot of quantitative studies, not only in migration studies, but out, throughout the social sciences and across science in general. And it's the understanding, and I, wanna, I guess one of the principles that lies behind this is that we don't, when we come to a truth claim, when we come to an accepted form of knowledge, we don't forget it, right? We don't um, discard the things that we agree upon, but that we, we slowly build and, and develop our knowledge about the nature of migration. Migration politics for me is the, is the main focus. Um, and then develop our inquiries based on that, that set of shared understandings. And this is a problem for me in, in the study of contemporary migration studies, because this field, as I understand it, rests on a highly selective collective amnesia about its past, right? And I'll repeat that, a highly selective form of collective amnesia about its past. And I wanna give you an example of that. And this is from an article that, um, that I think I've given a link to Ilka um, for in, in, the, in international political sociology, where I argue that when I look at the foundation of the modern immigration regime, and this is, um, you know, the very idea that states should be the ones in control of, of migration, that they should use territorial borders to, to institute that form of control, and that we should all run around carrying these things called passports in order to, um, to, to identify with one of those states and to be able to explain our rights to move across international borders. Now, in, as I read across, and I read across a lot of the, the literature on this, on the study of this regime and where it came from and its history, I repeatedly came across the idea that this regime had been constructed in Europe somewhere between the 17th and the 20th centuries, and was then after it was, was established in its pristine form, then extended to the rest of the globe, right? Like, so once Europe had established the basic rules of the game, the, the next step was to, to extend those rules to elsewhere uh, around the world. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, this, what I call a myth about the, the study of, of the modern immigration regime was that um, there was very little empirical data to support this or very few studies that actually waged or developed this argument. John Torpy's um, invention of the passport, which is one of the more common things that people are familiar with, um, has, has, has sort of trotted out a version of this, this history. Um, but when you just scratch at the surface of this myth, it, it really is one of those ideas that begins to fall apart relatively quickly because it's not actually built on historical research. And actually the weight of, of historical research suggests that most of the principles that, that we come to know as, as, as foundations of this migration regimes were either established in colonial settings um, um, in, in, in large part in colonial um, settlement colonies, but also in, in areas that we would now um, associate with the developing world. What I found interesting about this, this particular myth is that um, whilst it, it sort of begins in the 1990s and, and gets more popular as we enter the 2000s, if you look back in, in the history of the study of the, the origins of this regime, we have many works that actually contest it. One of the ones that I'd like to suggest for um, some of the you know, people listening out there today is Laura Tabili's um, We Ask for British Justice, which is just a classic work which studies how the principles of migration governance were literally brought home from the British colonies on ships, right, in, in, the, in the governance of sailors to um, back to Britain, right? Like that in, in the governance of the movement of sailors, that these principles would then, then became the foundation of, of the British migration regime. And what was interesting to me is that it really required a sort of a, 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 a form of forgetting to, to ignore this form of knowledge and to, to produce and reproduce this idea that somehow in Westphalia or in 
in the early 1920s after the, the, the First World War that Europe was responsible for creating this, um, this regime. Now, on a ho more hopeful note, and I said I'd, I'd be begin each of these, um, uh, uh, or end each of these sort of sections by thinking about hopeful notes, there's a lot of different works out there that are beginning to change and challenge and provide us with new histories, right? Adam McCown's Melancholy Order would be one which looks at the relationships with the, between North America and East Asia. Radhika Mongia's Indian Migration and Empire is another example, which looks at it. it's a post-colonial rate um, reading of the migration regime. The problem for these works is that these sorts of myths and these Eurocentric ideas about where migration governance come from, comes from, where it was first produced, are not based on empirics. They're based on forgetting. And how, through research, do you unravel and unpack amnesia um, when, it, when it seems to be some, something that is core to the, the, the foundation of our field and our discipline? This idea that it's the ideas that resonate with the Eurocentric idea of, of, of this regime that tend to hold purchase, that tend to remain strong, regardless of the nature of the empirical record. So that's one area in which I think like a very conventional understanding of how um, uh, we should order our understanding of, of migration and migration politics can help to reframe the way in which and, and work decolonial ideas into um, the field of migration studies. Another one that I think is, is core to me is the principle of representativity. Now, this is the idea that claims about a given object of study ought to be based on, on a relatively unbiased selection of empirical data, right? And representativity is something that you get as a first sort of principle when you're doing any form of introduction to quantitative research methods. Now, this is a principle that one would assume would be at the core of, of the way in which we've sought to understand migration and for me the study of migration politics but it's never how the knowledge production in our field has actually worked in in, in instead and drawing imp implicitly on the previous idea that, that migration governance is something that begins in europe and then is extended elsewhere most research has begun by starting with European or North American case studies. I think so, you know, Rogers Brubaker's uh, um, study of the, of the citizenship regime would be a perfect example and kind of the model upon which many studies are built. And then once the model has, is established in that context, we then begin to seek, well, first of all, you know, once we've done it in Germany, we'll, we'll maybe do a, a cross comparison with a UK case. And once we've done it in those cases, maybe we'll stretch across the Atlantic to study the US as well. And that we sort of, this is the way and the conventional way in which we've sought to build up knowledge, always starting from a Euro-American center and then moving outwards from there. Now, this is a problem in our field because it, it tends to put, and, and, it's, and it becomes, becomes more problematic when you see it from the flip side, right? From people who don't study those contexts and the type of presumptions that they face when they try to introduce truth claims into the study of migration and migration politics. Like whereas Rogers Brubaker, when he begins his book about France and Germany, begins with a presumption, which he doesn't have to fight that hard against, that he's working with what we might call a typical case. When, for example, Helene Thiolet um, works on, writes on guest worker systems in the Gulf states, or when Kamal Sadiq writes on the paper citizens of India and Malaysia, they have to fight the opposite battle, the presumption that their models are outliers, right? That, or, or atypical cases. And that's a very difficult presumption to work against. And it's a, and it's a difficult understanding of politics to try, um, to try and establish new forms of theory from cases that don't begin in, um, in Euro America, in, in, the, in the global North. Another way in which area in which we see this sort of this uh, principle playing out is not simply in this small scale comparative or cross comparative work, but in the production of quantitative data across that that's comparative across a much larger selection of countries. And here we've seen a very familiar pattern where the cases that are selected or the sample of countries that we study in order to develop more general statements about migration and the, and the politics of migration 
that we start always with this core set of countries and then move outwards from there. And I'd like to share with you one example of that, right? Um, which is the, um, the there's a recent, so there's, we've recently entered a period in which we have a number of data sets coming out, which look at um, uh, an attempt to study migration policies. And it's, I've been interested, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna actually talk about the studies themselves, but I just wanna talk about the way in which these studies have gradually sought to expand their selection of countries that they study. Um, so the first study that came out began with 20 OECD countries as, it, as the countries that it selected for its data set. And from that, it sought to, to develop more general statements about the nature um, of, of, inter, of international migration politics. The second study um, studied 33, 33 OECD countries, right? And as, as its attempt to say, hey, look, your sample is, is too small. We need to expand this so that we can have a, a broader understanding of the nature of migration politics. Now, the more recent study, and I'm not using this as a critique because I really like this study, it was an attempt to try and, and move beyond this. And this is the DMIG database. Um, uh, I think Katarina Natter is in, the, is in the audience and she's one of the people respond, uh, responsible for putting this together. And this is a selection of all of the countries that the DMIG database um, chose in order to move beyond this OECD focus of most, um, of most of the previous quantitative studies on migration politics. And what's interesting about this database is, first of all, that it does do what the other ones don't do, right? That it does move beyond the OECD countries and begins to study countries like, you know, Indonesia, um, South Africa, uh, countries that don't normally feature as core in the field of migration studies. But on the other side, this is a, a study that's attempting to make general claims about migration politics. And it's really interesting that nonetheless, this tendency to to overrepresent, to oversample countries in Europe, right? The, the countries in the left-hand column um, remains a prominent part and a prominent feature of the way in which um, uh, they are developing more general and testing more general claims about the nature of migration politics. So it's not simply in small scale qualit qualitative work, but also in this large scale quantitative work that's specifically trying to, to establish, you know, more broad generalizations about the nature of the field and about the nature of migration politics, where we see this tendency and this, this strange um, a form of, of an approach to representativity appear and dominate. And I think that that's not because for the DMIG study, they necessarily um, have any sort of implicit biases in the way in which they've constructed that database. In fact, I think that they were deliberately trying to move back towards a, a more representative sample, but it's that the, the claims that are likely to be privileged on the basis of this data are the claims about Europe and North America, not the other claims about the rest of the world. So I just got, I mean, uh, you know, and again, on a, on a hopeful note, like to end this, this, this sort of discussion of representativity, I think we've seen changes in parallel or different forms of studies that should be more, um, give us more confidence that we can see changes in the way in which we also do migration studies. For example, we're seeing a lot of case-based research by people, um, Hrasima Surapas, Katarina Natas in the audience who does this sort of work who've moved beyond um, the, the selection of conventional studies that we've chosen and begun to conduct more case-based research in the global south. But we've also got um, a good example, and I would look at the, the field of conflict studies as, as an exemplar here, of research that was once focused on Europe and North America, but basically made the move, I guess, 10, 15 years ago to say, in their field of conflict, to say, where's the body count? Like, where is the problem here? What, where can we find the core of our problematic. And, and it turns out that places like Latin America and Africa were where they really needed to begin their study. And you've seen a massive sea change in that field. And it's one we might see as well, I think, in, in the study of migration studies. So I've got, I think, not too long to go. Um, please, uh, Omar, let me know if I'm running over time. But I've got one more point um, uh, to, to hand over, and that is on the principle of objectivity. And I think many of uh, you in the audience, if you either you know, 
are from the Global South, I, if you're interested in researching the Global South, will be um, familiar with the dynamic that I'm gonna outline here. Now, the principle of objectivity is the idea that the identity and position of a researcher, this is one framing of it anyway, the identity and the position of a researcher should, shouldn't impact the nature or status of the claims that they make. Now, this would be really, it would be really great if this was a principle that actually worked and was, was followed to its fullest in migration studies. But anyone who's ed edited a, a migration studies journal will be familiar with the dynamic that I'm going to identify. And that is that our journals in our field are specifically geared to regard the type of knowledge that's commonly developed by researchers in the global south as ipso facto redundant. And here I'm specifically referring to the fact that often researchers in the global south face a very different political economy of knowledge production. It's one that's been outlined, I think, best by um, Lauren Landau in his um, work on communities of knowledge and tyrannies of partnership. It was published a while back in the Journal of Refugee Studies, where he identifies that often scholars who, who work in the global south um, face a, a totally different set of constraints, right? There is no European Research Council saying, here is the, you know, the blue sky, here is the funding for the blue skies research that, that, that you want to do. But rather often it's a series of philanthropics, international organizations, development oriented research that really funds and determines the sort of research that, 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 um, that people yeah, working in countries like South Africa or India or Thailand where I've worked um, often do. And the moment that any of this research appears at the desk of editors in, in journals, um, which are commonly based in the global north, they are automatically desk rejected as redundant. Now, this is not necessarily because of the poor quality of the research, but I would argue it's because that there's a, there's a real discursive break between um, the principles that are used to develop that, those forms of research and the, the criterion, and the sorts of both intellectual fads, um, stylistic issues, framing, referencing, and language issues, and also the way in which our scholarly discourse in migration studies tends to tend to revolve about around very insider debates. That means that a lot of this research gets often desk rejected out of hand at, before being even given the chance to influence how we think. About, about about politics, about migration, about the way these um, uh, these dynamics play out, and I think that this is something that I'm really just struggling with as a as a, a editor of a new journal, Migration Politics, where we're trying to not replicate some of these same dynamics and try to establish a more coherent dialogue between research in the global north and south, and it's a really difficult challenge. I think you can find some um, really good initiatives. Um, the a Academy for African Urban Diversity is doing great work, as is the African Research Universities Alliance, in trying to bring a group of emerging, groups of emerging scholars based in Africa um, together to try and work out how they navigate and get past some of these um, sort of structural ob obstacles to publishing in, um, in journals in, based in the global north. But I think it actually comes down and will come down to whether the journals themselves and the editors of those journals are willing to change their practices to incorporate and provide a space for this sort of knowledge. And, and I'll end uh, um, on, on this note by, by saying that the knowledge that is produced by scholars in the global south is not something that is totally separate to the knowledge production and what becomes um, mainstream discourse in many migration studies journals. Often it's work, the work of people like myself is to really go and translate the, 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 the data that has been generated by all of these researchers into, into words that can be understood in the sort of more cloistered language of our field and of our disciplines. Um, and so we really need to work out ways and think through new ways of trying to give um, that research, the, the respect and the, um, the status that it deserves. And I'll end on that note. Okay, thank you very much, Dashan. I think very, uh, very insightful. And um, I already have a small question ready, but I would like to ask uh, Leila first, if she would like to uh, 
uh, respond or have a has um, a for now i'm fine maybe i can respond at the end also all together yeah. to the but if you have a question go ahead Ilke. yeah yeah, yeah. I um, I'm fascinated uh, by uh, by your talk and uh, presentation, uh, Dash, and I also enjoyed very much reading um, the articles. And I what I had the impression, and and especially with the kind of the the, the two first points on uh, we have to look at the principle of accumulation accumulation of of knowledge, and that's the reason why we need this decolonial project in migration studies and also uh, representativity of data. I have the impression, in a way, that you you try to um, talk the, the language of the opponent to convince. <laughs> uh, so that's a strategy. At the same time, um, in a way, I mean, it is, I, I, it's very convincing. I mean, for better knowledge, I mean, it, for better knowledge, um, we definitely um, need to listen to other voices. And, and there's, in, it's incredible that certain um, explanatory variables have been um, neglected and that, and that we start from myths just because of uh, this Eurocentric um, focus. At the same time, it, it seems to, I mean, Kind of convincing by this by these principles uh, so keen to positivist um, western knowledge production it seems to kind of contradict also a bit the third um, part of your presentation where there you say we, we need more openness to other forms of knowledge production so i i wondered whether you see also the um yeah this kind of tension or um, or you don't, <laughs> and um, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I—I I mean, I—I'm—I don't want to be—I'm not doing this for as a trick, <laughs> right? Just to just to like get it out there that I, I actually genuinely believe it, right? And that mm -hmm. um, that I think that um, that it is the the strategy as well that we can actually form consensus between decolonial forms of thought and mainstream migration studies. And I think actually, when you earnestly talk to most people in the field, they will agree with these basic points. That, yes, we need to be more, you know, up, up for greater representativity. We need to think through case selection in a way that's not so biased um, and, and those sorts of things. The other, uh, I mean, the other point about, you know, research approaches and research that's conducted in the global south is that, I'd say that most of it is actually positivist <laughs> and and because it's often framed in a way that has to be digestible for donors who are looking for measurables for for outputs that can be, you know, discerned and weighed in those sorts of ways. And um, and in, in that sense, I think actually that gap is is far less of a problem for those researchers. The gap is more in the very insider debates and dialogues um, and also ways of framing ideas that um, most of the people listening in, in this um, group will just take for granted because they are inculcated in them. We know them offhand. We know how to pitch an article to a journal and how to frame our ideas in the right way. But to scholars whose bread and butter is writing reports for NGOs and philanthropics, it's a really difficult task. And it's a, it's a constantly changing task, right? Like it's that, um, and, and I don't think we are equipped to, to do that translation for them. Um, that, and, and that's where I'm looking for dialogue and ways of, of moving beyond those problems. Okay, but we'll we'll continue uh, the debate um, later, also with a with a Q and A session, and um, I look forward then to hearing uh, Leila, um, who has um, another um, kind of point of entry um, into uh, what we can do uh, towards a decolonial approach in migration studies. Yeah, thanks very much, Ilke, and thanks very much, Darshan. My account is a bit more personalized, um, and I try to narrate also my, um, my perspectives on the issue from my own personal observations, but also, of course, building on the important work of decolonial studies. And, and for this also, wait, let me also try to share my screen. One second. Let me, okay. Do you see the screen? Should work now. 
Um, does it work, Ilke? Do you see it? Yes, it is working. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. Slide. Pardon? No, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I want to start a little bit also with a remark, namely about my own situated agency and my own situated knowledge. I think it's especially in a debate like this about decolonial uh, lens to migration studies, it's important to also to highlight this or point this out. So in one sense, I want to say um, that I am myself identified as a migration researcher, but I'm a specific type of migration researcher, namely I do study migration governance. And for me, this implies also that I look at institutions, laws and norms and debates and understandings of migration. So in studying migration governance, uh, how I see it and the people I collaborated with see it means understanding migration, its causes and its effects as an output of migration governance. Um, so put very simply, um, there is nothing such as migration um, without borders. And I think, and I believe this is fundamentally different from approaches in migration research who study migrants or migration um, as a phenomenon in itself. So because we can, studying migration governance, we can never see it detached or in isolation from structured structures, processes and institutions that render migration meaningful in certain ways. And I think here is also where the decolonial approach comes in because this approach, approach makes us aware that these ways migration are rendered meaningful are always, um, entrenched in historically sedimented continuities that are rooted in European colonialism and racialization that enabled and legitimized colonialism in the first place. And I think, but it's also important to me that I think that migration and is not only rendered through the colonial, um, through these colonial uh, continuities, there is also other frames that scholars studying migration governance have to focus on, um, but this colonial um, sedimented frame is certainly fundamental. And also I think when we speak about posi position and positionality, also and speaking about European migration research that in many ways, I'm a very European migration researcher since I was trained and had the privilege to be um, in European or other institutions of the global north which often are seen or self-identify as places of elite scholarship. So, but in other ways, I'm also very much not European because I'm, I'm seen and perceived and partly self-identify as non-European. So I'm saying this um, because I think like many of us, I am privileged. I'm extremely privileged, but at the same time also not privileged in other ways. Um, and through my privileges, I'm an active part of this, as a decolonial approach would tell us, of a neo-colonial system. And at the same time, in being not privileged in other ways, I'm also affected by this very same neo-colonial system and, and ways of producing knowledge. Um, so I think this is important to, to say because it has implications for how we speak, how we reason, how I speak and how I reason. Um, and yeah, so put very bl bluntly, my position and my knowledge is situated in partial, in, in partial and specific ways like anyone else's is. Um, but in this means also it's incomplete and it cannot provide for a comprehensive picture. But at best, I really hope to engage here with all of you um, and with Darshan in a, um, with an, in a dialogue to stimulate some common thinking about our common challenges. Um, and I also want to say thank you very much for the invitation. I really feel extremely privileged also to share the floor with Darshan, who has done lots of meticulous and historically contextualized work on providing non-Eurocentric perspectives to European migration research debates. Um, as I said, like I wrote lots of my own um, 
of my own thinking and my own experiences means also in my own intuition from based on, on who I am, what I have seen, but also based on, of course, lots of rich debates in the field on decolonial uh, approaches and methods. And I urge everyone, I mean, lots of scholars have been already mentioned by Darshan, but also by Ilke in the introduction. But I also urge everybody to study the reference list of Lucy Mabelis, Mabelins and Joe Turner's book on migration studies and colonialism. I think it's a really good start and I want to um, recommend. So, and also what Lucy and Joe themselves are asking not to reference them, but reference who they refer to in the debates they refer to. Um, so, but I also want to a little bit also think about ways where I think there might be also some shortcomings and where uh, we have to as migration researchers, but also uh, people who represent and have lots of, done lots of important work on decolonial studies have to still engage in more dialogue and reflection. Um, and I think to jump right into the topic, um, also to say why I'm, I all, I'd all think it's important to speak about this, I want to share a little anecdote, a, a personal story. Um, so quite some years back, I attended a conference it was a conference for and by international uh, relations scholars, many of which are also migration scholars. And these migration scholars were from all across the globe. And when I say from all across the globe, and it means in the settings of such conferences, it means usually from Europe and North America. This conference took place in New Orleans, a city, as many of you will know or have already visited the city in the south of the United States, a city uh, which people are deeply racialized and related to this um, also is the city with one of the highest poverty rates among US metropolitan areas. Um, and the conferences are, as these huge conferences usually are, was held in a big luxury resort hotel. Um, and to be honest, at this point of time, I felt very out of place. Um, but what I even felt more that I felt that many of these people at the conferences were out of place. Or if you want to embody it in a very provokingly way, he embodied some colonial habitus. Um, and I, as one of them, um, took part in this um, because people, all these researchers were visiting this, this space, were visiting New Orleans and profiting from it, but without really engaging with it. So this is where I saw some traces or some colonial habitus. Um, so many people in Grace Youth um, comrading with their academic peers and talking about academic issues um, that at least to me seemed somehow remote out to the world out there when you just made a step out of this Hilton Hotel. Um, so at this point of time, like after some months after, I don't dwell into the story now, but I left academia. But as you see here, I, I came back um, and I took something from this incident because this incident, it, it made me, it left me truly uncomfortable and, and, and sad at the time. Um, it, I learned that it's maybe not be the right answer to leave something behind and turn your back on something, but maybe the better answer is to in, uh, engage in dialogue and think how another academia can look like and strengthen what is partly already in the making. So for me, this is somehow also how I in, uh, interpret it personally is part of a decolonial approach, sharing our, our personal experiences where we feel uncomfortable. Um, and since likely our, our perceptions are not unique, um, but they also reflected in much of the thinking and writing on a decolonial academic approach. Um, let me just go to the third slide, right? And, and I want to jump now to another to illustrate also what it means for me from my personal experience. I want to fast forward several years 
again an ISA, an International Relations Studies Conference, another Hilton Hotel, this time in Toronto. And I was among the people about among the scholars who went to panels from migration studies section, but also to sections that include post-colonial um, queer of color studies. So here, so and these approaches are usually not represented in panels on migration studies. And what was really striking for me at this conference um, is that all these panels where post-colonial approaches um, took place, alliances took place at the beginning of the sessions, what they did, they made a land acknowledgement statement that the land we were on does belong to specific in indigenous people and that we are grateful um, to be able to, to work on this land. So I just, I, I, I took the, the land acknowledgement of the time, so you see it on, on the slide here. And so what was striking for me that all these panels had this land acknowledgement, but none of the migration panels I visited and I myself actively um, engaged in and, and, and was part of, none of those did. So, and I don't think, and I think it's important also to say that I don't think that any of the migration panel leaders were malignant or evil. I think there is, or there has been, at least at the time, simply no, no institutionalized awareness by the migration field about these uh, themes. And I think you can say it was a particular manifestation of what post-colonial and critical race scholars call this amnesia of race and colonialism of migration studies. Um, and decolonial approaches have called migration studies out for admitting that racism is intrinsic, is constitutive of con contemporary European societies, and in particular of migration and border regimes. I think this critique, I also want to lift or say this here, is at times a little generalizing and broad brushed. But as my anecdote from this conference in Toronto also points out, in many ways it is a discomforting truth that migration scholars, that we as migration scholars have to face. Um, and also, then we can ask why, why is there this underrepresentation of racism or a decolonial approach or method in migration studies? And I think there has been, this has been explained and can indeed be explained how these fields, how these different fields of research emerged. In many contexts, as opposed, for instance, to racism research that emerged bottom up from activism, migration research has been often state-driven, top-down. And this was in, in many contexts uh, true, but certainly not in all. For instance, I think as, as far as I know, but also Darshan might correct me here, he knows more. In the Netherlands, this was the case historically. In my own country, Austria, um, where I'm based, this hasn't been the case. But in many contexts, even where it emerged um, in this state-driven manner, driven by goals of population control, this doesn't mean that the relationship between the state and migration scholarship has been um, not conflictual, it has been also conflictual in this context. I think this is also important to state. And I think the second and the related point we can make is that uh, the critical race that this also has made is that migration research is often about the migrant. So it means about the figure that is constructed and thought of as the other, or as for instance, Abdel Malik Sayyad already made us aware of many, many decades ago, the immigrant is always a displaced, out of place figure in every sense of the term. Immigration is always problematized. So, um, so if, if migration research does not look at structures, institutions and practices of others, of othering, but if it takes the other, the migrant as a natural set starting point, um, then it, it perpetuates also this problematization. So, so to say it naturalizes the migrant and migration as a phenomenon. Um, and I think again, this critique by critical race studies and other counts is true, but again, sometimes oversimplified. 
I want to again go back to my own discipline, which I love, of course, as a political scientist. Political science does not look at the migrant as the exotic or the problematic other, but it looks how migration is governed and by doing so constitutes migration as a problem and constructs the problem. It then sets out to, to solve. Um, and there is lots of other good research from other disciplines in European migration research who also looks at these uh, mechanisms of producing migration categories and migration problems, so to say. But again, I think indeed migration studies, especially studies that look at migrants and migration has a, has a job to do. So we have a job here to do in questioning its very own foundation and its analytical lens. And I have to admit, I also feel um, discomfort with studies that research ethnic migrant group X in location Y. So and I sometimes wonder what does migrant mean? What does ethnicity XY mean? Um, in itself, for me, these are meaningless, meaningless categories, all despite they're very powerful categories perpetuating a problematic group of others that needs to be managed. So, and the third point that often is, uh, is raised in decolonial approaches is about the migration literature canyon. So the world leading migration scholars um, are from places in the global north. They are white, they are English speaking, and they're often male. And I think much of the, um, again, I think much of the critique on this literary canyon is, is sometimes it's oversimplified. It sometimes um, pretends as if these scholars would have nothing to tell us, nothing to teach us. And I personally, I learned a lot from these people and I have, and I'm grateful to have discovered them. It opened a world of debate for me I haven't known before. But again, it is equally and certainly true that this canon omits certain perspectives and understandings, and that these scholars often are understood in positive and authoritative terms, not exclusively, but also qua their anthematized status as white, male, heterosexual, and or as native English speakers. So I myself, having been at, at privileged uh, institutions doing my PhD, for instance, at the European University Institute, I had to unlearn to cite scholars that do not belong to this core canyon in order to link to leading debates in the field. I have unlearned to some extent to read broadly, also to read non-leading, non-English uh, speakers, scholars, and to focus um, but instead to focus on the English speaking leading scholars in the field and the leading uh, migration and political science journals out there. And I have to learn to aspire to publish in them as well if, if, if this would make my res research better. And I think it does not make my research better, but it makes it more visible and seen. So all these conditions to survive in academia are processes of unlearning and adapting to certain norms that exclude other perspectives and debates. And I think this is also, at times it's a tiring process. It involves lots of effort, especially when you're not an English native speaker. Um, and also, of course, you have, learn, you have to learn to come back to the conferences I mentioned earlier, you have to learn at least to tolerate the spectacle of huge international conferences. And you also need to have the means to travel there, which even in an institute of privilege, for instance, like the European University, even there, money uh, is scarce and relies on third party funding. So imagine how it is for scholars in non-privileged institutions to travel to these huge spectacles of migration conferences. And this is also true for migration, for access to migration journals or journals in general. Without my European University library card, I sometimes could not even access journal articles I have written myself. And this brings me to the funding structure. Um, and again, this is not specific to migration research, but research in general, the reliance on third party funding. 
but this has specific implications for migration research. And already decades ago, the Australian so migration scholar Stephen Castle. So it was Stephen Castle's um, one of the who is part of this core canyon of of migration scholars. Um, he said because social scientists often allowed their research agendas to be driven by policy needs and funding. They often ask the wrong questions, relied on short term empirical approaches without looking on historical and comparative dimensions and failed to develop adequate theoretical frameworks. The key point is that policy driven research can lead not only to poor sociology, but also to bad policy. Um, this is because narrowly focused empirical research accepts the problem definitions built in in term of references and does not look for more fundamental causes or for more challenging solutions. And this is also very important. Ministers and bureaucrats still see migration as something that can be turned on and off like a tap through laws and policies. By imposing this parad paradigm on researchers, policymakers have done both social scientists and themselves a disservice. But we have to ask ourselves the uncomfortable question, why have so many of us accepted this role? So this is Stephen Castle's um, decades ago. So this is nothing new. And this is nothing um, which comes from the colonial scholars. This comes some, from somebody who is at the core of this migration canon. And I also want to say also now, um, but what do we mean, Ilke? Am I over time or still? More or less two words that I thought you were closing. That's why I get on. <laughs> nearly, nearly there. I'm trying to rush. Um, but also, what is a decolonial method about? And I think here I don't have to go much more into it because I think Darshan here did a fantastic job. Um, but it's just want to say that the decolonial method is about justice, but which kind of justice? So this quest for justice goes beyond social justice and aims at epistemic and cognitive justice. So, um, so this is what I don't expand here because this is, has been already said, but I think it's important. And here I quote um, Meneses de Sousa. Um, so it's about the truly universal, universal perspective, not the globalized local as the Western Canyon, but one that emerges from critical dialogue between diverse epistemic and uh, ethical, sorry, not ethnic, ethical political projects. Um, so how to make, so the question is now to get real and to get a bit more applied, how to make a decolonial approach stick. Um, so I think also, um, and, and here I might say something that might be controversial to many, but I'm not entirely sure how decolonial, uh, decolonial scholarly debates are led today are always futile or productive. I think they often alienate since much of, of this literature also is the literature produced mostly in Europe, to be fair, is attacking dominant scholarship instead of showing productive new avenues. Um, not all, like there is also, of course, lots of research that is exactly showing these new avenues, but showing what is in for all of us. So what I want to say that we have to be cautious that about the certain moral superiority and arrogance, maybe also sometimes with those who don't share the same decolonial perspectives. Why? Not because I don't agree with the approach, but I think if, if it is harmful if we want to get hurt and not only preach to the converted. Um, so I think we could do also with some reframing in the debate and instead of attacking those who do not think like us, it has to be made clear why it is to be why it is productive to take a decolonial approach. Um, so maybe very simply create allies, not enemies. Um, and I think I also understand from my own experience that it can be extremely tiring of, of not being heard. But also I think it can be wise to pause a moment and ask maybe my moral foundations um, that are in the case also of a decolonial approach, mostly about care and justice are not the only values people care about. So if these are my values, my interests, 
Um, and how do I make myself heard in a world which people also might have other values that are more or equally important to them? So by attacking and, and questioning what scholars, dominant scholars, yeah, did all their life, I'm also creating some cognitive dissonance. I make other people feel uncomfortable. You could say that, that challenging dominant scholarly perspectives that perpetuate oppression um, by perpetuating racism, they will have to live with this discomfort. And it's just fair that this discomfort is, is produced. But in principle, yes, you could say just fair. But what such an argument ignores is that this discomfort will lead people to rejecting what is said in decolonial accounts of not hearing or at best paying lip service instead of really engaging and reflecting. Um, I, I'm aware I'm already over time. So I just maybe very shortly and to end up is like how to make a decolonial approach productive in European academia and migration studies or societies at large. I think it's also that it has to go beyond critique and showing like practices how academia can be transformed. And I think and this also comes down to, to question the obsession with age indexes, grants, and world-leading four-star publications in research excellence frameworks. Um, I personally, I cannot do this. I do not possess this privilege, but people who have permanent positions in academia, they can do. Um, I think also the journal that Darshan set up together with his wonderful colleagues also in Amsterdam is a good example and a good start for changing, uh, attempting to change the, the rules of the game. Um, and also I think what is important here is also that many um, decolonial approaches carry forward an association of migration with misery. Accounts like necropolitics uh, that focused on racialized death in the Mediterranean or on horrible situations in encampments, they continue to dehumanize migrants by reporting about dehumanizing and racialized practices in, men, in migration regimes, unwillingly or inadvertently, um, colonial ideas of the migrant others as inhuman are, are reproduced. If migration is only associated with misery, how can people identify with people on the move as humans? I know this is a very hard question. It's not easy because omitting violence against minoritized racialized groups is not the solution. Um, but also associating, associating mi migration predominantly with misery, um, and to speak about this is not the solution either. So what I'm saying that these accounts have become part of the problem came to, to address in the first place. Um, and yeah, so I think also, um, I think also to, to create the politics of hope and the politics of similarities um, is also useful. And of course here many, many will disagree. Um, many decolonial scholars might disagree with me um, because, because of course we are not all, all um, like dominated or equally dominated or oppressed. And of course there is clear differences, but I think there is also, also where possible and sometimes it will not be possible. Sometimes alliances um, also by scholars won't be possible, but where it is possible, like make them visible, speak about them. For instance, like, and I will end on this example, take the biometric surveillance techniques that help to militarize borders and has been the focus of much post-colonial research. So migrants or minoritized racialized groups are the testing grounds, but ultimately um, these surveillance techni techniques are used against everyone, also against citizens uh, in the global north and the constrained liberties. Um, so as I said, indeed in some aspects, alliances are difficult since we are not all equally dominated, but there is also commonalities by which we can reach wider audiences and make them success acceptable for these important debates. And like this, we can also be attentive to unproductive competing oppressions or um, struggles in the sense. So I want to, to end here, sorry for going over time.
uh, but I hope that, that I have started to stimulate also um, or some discussions on these matters. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Leila. I think your your both uh, presentations were very uh, complementary, um, and also I think that I I see some uh, some debate uh, between them because also the. Um, I mean, talking about the moral superiority of the decolonial project then links possibly to um, um, Darshan's uh, appeal for, for seeing it more as the epistemological project for better uh, knowledge production. Um, Darshan, you maybe want to react before I um, go and then we open the debate to the floor. No, I mean, like, I just, I just love uh, Layla's work on, like, in her thinking of really putting positionality front and center um, was was a great move, and I think it's actually going to help us to answer a lot of the questions in the chat box. There's like people who are looking for a first step in how to address like these these issues in their own research. So maybe we can start from there, and um, yeah, uh, and then we'll, we can engage as we go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, uh, Layla, for this. For this move towards positionality, which is, is is very important to to reflect upon, if if one wants to move um, to more openness to decolonial approach, and um, then um, and probably, I mean, for me, it's it's also the the question of how much indeed um, that plays, even for the majority of um, for white researchers um, doing, I mean, having or not an openness towards towards this approach and how, how much positionality plays. And I also, I mean, you also went into the question of why, why we see um, this, this, this kind of two different um, fields and worlds and why we saw um, so little um, of, of the decolonial knowledge in the migration studies. Um, you also responded to that question, which indeed with the, with the more activist uh, origins of um, of the the decolonial um, approaches and then um, less activist and more uh, state driven approaches from um, for for migration studies, but not not only so. So um, I think it, it it's nice to uh, to maybe open um, the floor for the questions and I leave um, I give the word to uh, to Omar. Yeah, thank you so much, Ilke. Thank you, Darsan and Leila, for the very brilliant presentations that you have delivered. We've had a couple of questions here, and then we'll start with Natalie, who asks, Darsan, what advice do you have for early career researchers, that is PhD students based in Europe, and funded to do research on a European case study in relation to the integration of immigrants, but who are striving to approach their research from a decolonizing perspective? Sure, and I think Leila like, could also respond to this. I mean, like, um, I, I would say like, you know, the, the positionality um, point that, that Leila raises is a really good starting point, right? Like think about like who you're funded, why they're funding you and, and what is the, the aim of the research from that perspective. Um, uh, and that can help you to sort of get at sort of the nuts and bolts and thinking about where you are situated in this process of knowledge production. And it's a, it's a helpful first step. There's obviously going to be limits to what you can do depending on the parameters of your research, right? Like if you're, you know, there to find out about how we can better deliver housing towards migrant communities, there's limits to, to how far you can, you know, extend the parameters of the research and the way in which it's constituted. The one thing I've always been like really interested to do for any of you who are out there looking at integration research is to really start thinking about integration and, and why migrants are the target of it, right? I think particularly in our day and age, and like the pandemic is a good like uh, uh, teacher here of the fact that the people who don't necessarily adopt the norms of, of our civil society, not necessarily migrants, right? It's that, that dude who won't wear a face mask when he comes into your class or that, <laughs> you know, that person who today just, uh, you know, put up a pipe bomb out front of a testing center in the Netherlands, right? That they're, there is groups of our, in, in our society that we could consider who haven't necessarily the adopted, adopted the norms of what we consider to be European liberal democracy. Why isn't the integration light being shone on them? Um, uh, and I'd be, I'd be, I'm intrigued to, to you know, because I think that reveals some of the racial racialized assumptions behind the integration discourse. 
and also the the idea that mobility is is the the source of the integration problem so those are just some thoughts mm -hmm. okay and christopher asks what do you think scholars from the global north should do to avoid reinforced neurocentrism when they do work on global north case studies as part of their broader research I think this is an open question for both So, so the question is how to how to avoid um, in, in global studies on the global north, from the global north, about the global north? Yeah, I can, I can read the question again uh, one more time. What do you think scholars from the global north should do to avoid reinforced neurocentrism when they do work on global north case studies as part of their broader research? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so about, I think, I mean, that's very, yeah, so that's a very good and very tricky question at the same time. And I think it's also, I mean, when you deal with phenomenon um, in the, I, I don't like also the words global south and, and, and global north. I also want to say this because it does like, like there would be no global south in the global north and no global north in the global south. And I mean, it's much more complex and I think this reproduces binaries. So I think we also have to be attentive. And also I see often now like in, in job advertisements and hirings that they search for people doing research on the global south. I think this is problematic in itself if it puts it in essentialist ways, in a binary ways. But I think still the question is very good about the global north in the sense that also what, what can be learned from other experiences um, that always were, were thought of as, as, as deeply non-European, like when it comes to developments in democracies, what we see in, in, in Europe hugely right now, right? Like, I think what can we learn also from other parts of the world where there has been lots of insights, lots of experiences. So I think this can be also some engaging also with, with, with these lessons, I would say. But I think also what I, what I said before is also, I think this engaging can be also tricky and exchange in a sense, because what we see often, what I observed, what migration scholars in, 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 the, um, in, in Europe do, like, what they say is that it's um, that they put like researchers from the global south um, to use this term on their advisory boards, okay, for their research projects. I think this this is not what the decolonial method is about. It's because um, these most likely these people also will have studied in certain privileged places and will have very similar perspectives. So it's not about putting like people or like it's like tokenistic even, you know, you fulfill your duty, but it's about changing the way of thinking this epistemic starts and was, was talking about also. So I think here it's, it's more you do yourself work, like also what happens a lot now are scholarships, giving scholarships to people from the global south. Again, these selections and these are merit-based, merit-based in the sense that they don't question that merit is always uh, based in privilege also. There is no privilege-free merit, but that's what we present when we speak about grants, that we speak about where somebody has been educated in an Ivy League, that we speak about successful grants. We think about this as merit and we blend out privilege. So those people who get these scholarships, those people who we sit on the advisory boards, um, they're also not privilege free. So there is always a global north in the global south and the global south in the global north. I think that's also important. Thank you, Lael. And the other question from Francis, he says, thanks for the very insightful discourse on Darshan. I'm wondering if you might offer some commentary on the relationship between migration studies and the state of, and the state and international organizations such as the IOM and how this contributes to the challenge of working towards the coloniality. How does the policy orientation of much mainstream orthodox migration studies save the three matters we discuss here around accumulation of knowledge, representativity, and the principle of objectivity? Yeah, that's a very good and difficult question. <laughs> um, um, look, I, I think that, um, that a lot of the um, 
you know, the, the funding bodies that you're talking about are responsible for a lot of the knowledge production that happens in, sorry, Leila, I'm going to use the term global south, right? Like that, that, that a lot of the researchers who I work with in the, in those contexts, that, that they, that's their primary form of research funding, you know, these sorts of contracts and these sorts of works for these institutions. Um, and I actually find that in a lot of, it depends on the organization. It depends on who the philanthropic is, right? Um, you know, open society is one of the ones that I've worked with. Um, but there, I think that there's a lot of bandwidth. I, I'm not going to you know, give you a sort of a very broad discussion about, I think their role in, in coloniality, but I think there's much more bandwidth than we've often assumed in how researchers can negotiate with organizations like that about the terms of research, about the conceptual apparatus that needs to be used, the things that Layla was identifying, right? These, these sort of assumptions about who is a migrant, what is a migrant, what is a migration problem that um, then, then researchers have often thought. Um, and and that, that we should use that those opportunities, right? And that the savvy researchers have been doing it for years. I think we've been slow to, to collect that knowledge and to reflect on how people have been doing it. That's a big, the, one of the research institutes that I'm, I'm affiliated to, the African Center for Migration and Society have been great at doing this. Like basically taking this stream of funding and utilizing it for more conceptual and critical research. Um, and those are the sorts of positive sort of dimensions that I'd like to emphasize and, and point people to because um, you can play this game in a way and, and basically researchers that I'm familiar with in places like South Africa have been doing it for a long time. Yeah, I think, I think what also has to be added when we think about these organizations that to be frank and to be honest, um, also, um, so these organizations are much more influential when it's about the production of knowledge than my university migration researchers. I think this we also have to be honest about. So they're much more powerful, more influential because they directly translate they directly um, in the policy practice. But also I think what is, what is important is also, and I think there has been this fantastic book by, by Piku and Gaida also that we always question also how this in organization depolitized. So how and how maybe to find ways together also, maybe it's not possible, but also how to politicize question of migration. I mean, what I mean by this politicizing that, I mean, Geig and Pico have this very good example of the triple win. It's like there could be a win-win-win situation for everyone, for states, for sending states, for receiving states, for migrants. That's just an illusion. That's part of the, the internet, the agenda, but it's just, yeah, that's not how, how, how life and interest and power politics work. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for both of you and it's from Wilfred and he said, my name is Wilfred and I'm working as an integration teacher for migrants and refugees in Berlin, Germany. I would like to ask what role does the decolonization of EU migration studies play in the current fight against discrimination and racism in the EU? Does it play a role in this point of time? And is it really realistic? If yes, in, one, in what concrete way can it influence policy making? I mean, this is again, like, it's a hard one. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea. Like, you know, how can we actually make these sorts of ideas um, more practical and how can they actually begin to influence, you know, I guess, policy making and implementation, which is the sorts of things that, um, that the questioner is, is interested in. One of the things they already do, right? That actually a lot of the time when you speak to, you know, public officials, that they are aware, like, you know, the, 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 the trends that you see in sort of academic thinking, things like positionality, which Layla is referring to, is not necessarily like while they may come out of the academic sphere and we might think of them as as germane to what we do, it you can often find your ordinary bureaucrats in many European public offices are very familiar with these sorts of ideas, right? That they that they they're already there um, and and influencing and shaping the nature of the discourses in ways that we often might not expect. Um, yeah, I don't know, Leila. What would you add to that? <laughs> 
think this was more the question, what can migration studies do in terms of policy? But I think that's part of the, yeah, how to, um, how to, to, to be part or to be part of the conversation, no, but without reproducing certain types. I think it's also by asking, asking new questions and not already pre-formulated concepts for sure, in the sense that, that we could have an influence, but also I think people like you, like working on the ground, like, and, and, and also um, supporting and showing and making agency of people visible. I mean, this maybe has much more impact than a migration study scholars can have. So I think, yeah, I would give back also part of the, um, the, uh, the, the part of the knowledge production, how we see and we perceive of phenomena like migration to people also on the ground who do this important work. But um, just just to add, I also have the impression. I mean, as researchers, we are we are indeed uh, often asked to, I mean, to talk to to policy officials. And um, first, we see more um, um, researcher with a minority background, and um, and and this decolonial thinking also start to be, I mean, invited in in, in policy debates. But I think it's especially the activists, which I mean, in the Netherlands, in in and in, in the in Belgium, in France, and in, in the UK, who who have brought the debate and then the intellectual thinking um, to the forefront. Um, I think um, I mean Audrey Lord is now in the front of every every bookshop, and uh, so so policymakers also start to pick that up. And and terms like structural racism have been introduced now in the anti-racism action plan of the EU and, and the immigrant integration policymakers now know that they also have to work with their anti-racism colleagues well, before they, they did not talk. So these are very little changes at the same time. Um, yeah, the selectivity of the migration <laughs> policy um, is uh, from the same EU is, is um, um, is, is, is killing lives at the Mediterranean. So, I mean, but that, you see triggering, um, I think over the last years, um, the discourse um, and the, 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 the decolonial um, thinking um, and, and the attention, especially for race and racism um, in, with regards to immigrant integration, entering also the policy discourse. Uh, but I was thinking also <laughs> a few minutes here and I see that, um, the um, the time is is up. Uh, we knew that we would still have many questions <laughs> um, that 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 cannot necessarily uh, be responded. Um, Omar also um, you wanted to to share um, some some readings still um, to uh, to the crowds some some tools also in the whole spirit. Um, of educate yourself. <laughs> um, there's not only the students, there's also us. And I mean, these are the 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 the, the readings um, that also the, the students um, read and that are also of the um, yeah by the authors that have uh, spoken here on the on the first slide, and also some more on the second. But there's far more, far more than that. Um, and uh, Leila was such a sir shared some references um, and so if you watch the video you can check them again and I think uh, Darshan also wants to share uh, more in, the, in the, the message that all the participants uh, will receive so, um, so at least uh, what to do um, to, um, yeah, to, to improve um, decolonial thinking in our migration studies there is some tools um, here um, that are offered and, and some steps uh, towards uh, that endeavor, I think. <laughs> Uma? Yeah, thank you so much, Ilke. I actually had a question for Darsan, but I'm not sure if there's still time for that. I mean, you spoke about the need for, for knowledge that is produced from, from, from the global north, if I may use that term, to be Mm, considered as a valid knowledge, as knowledge that fulfills all the I mean hallmarks for for, for scientific I mean research, and also I mean this is just an experience as a student from the global I mean in South. Uh, I mean 
we, of course, people do research. We have scholars who go to Africa and do research and mostly white, especially when it relates to migration. But we also have African scholars that do research on, I mean, in, in Africa. And then these researches have implications for public policy as well. But also we have this challenge of African policymakers, especially leaders, accepting this research as valid. I mean, we have mm. this, still this challenge of accepting, I mean, research that is produced locally, because we have this, I mean, this colonial notion that whatever is produced outside is best and it's able to, I mean, fix our, our, our problems as well. So that is also another dimension that I think we could also consider in, in the whole, I mean, discussion as far as the colonizing migration studies is concerned. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Yeah, that that's a, that's a powerful dynamic. And one of the, I mean, the only thing that I could add to that would be to say that part of the reason why you know, Western scholars have the credibility that they have is that they have this long line of, of published work and this sort of credentials that are built on that, right? And that that's something very difficult for scholars outside of these cloistered networks to break into. Um, and Florian was asking me, like, you know, how, how, what are ways in which concretely we can begin to address that and like to, to change these sort of perceptions of validity? And I mean, I'm, I'm really committed to a concept of, um, of slow scholarship, right? Which which tries to think about the ways in which, you know, editors, editors are not just the front of house for a journal. They really need to extend beyond to, to try to reach out if they're interested in, in scholarship from the global south, to try to re reach out to, to scholarship as it is being produced and to try to draw it in and explain to, to scholars and, and, and assist and also open up their journals to, to allow, um, scholars who are producing for different purposes the time and the resources to to break through to those networks and it's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort but um but i think it's there's there's great value in it um and yeah that would be the sort of more positive note that that i think that you can achieve on on these these fronts it's just like how committed are you? Are you just going to say that in your byline on your editorial page? That, you know, we are welcome submissions from the Global South, or are you going to do something about that? And um, yeah, that's something that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, we look forward to the uh, experience also of the, the new journal. Um, thank you to, um, to everybody, to the speakers, um, to Omar for moderating and um, to the participants for listening and, and, and having your questions. We were very numerous, a bit less at the end, of course, it's dinner time, but we started with 150 participants. And um, I hope um, this is a debate uh, to be continued. And um, thank you very much um, to all and uh, looking forward to um, also see you at our uh, next activities, um, Omar was still, for those who are still there, um, sharing, I think, the uh, readings. If not, um, it can be shared in the message that will follow. Yeah, I also want to say thanks to everyone. It was a real pleasure and an honor <laughs> at the same time to engage with all of you. Um, and sorry if we haven't answered all the questions. I know this can be frustrating at times because there were lots of good questions. But yeah, write me, write Darshan. <laughs> we, we continue and engage in this discussion. We're happy to. So thanks for all of, to every one of you, to all of you. And have a good evening. Yeah, good evening to everybody. And thank you.